So my presentation this morning is going to take uh, two different uh, strands. The first one, I'm going to talk about a project I was involved in last year, which was the implementation of a real-time location system in a recently built uh, block called the Cardiff Center in St. H. And then I'm going to move on and quickly talk about a theory called disruptive innovation, which obviously you've probably all heard of. It's used, been used by quite a lot of different groups, including any that would use it in their recent annual conference title. Our government have talked about it as disruptive reform. So I'll spend a few minutes on that, and then I'll finally finish by hopefully applying the, I suppose, the, the theory and see can I categorize the real-time location system as being a disruptive innovation. So the following is a quick kind of a high-level uh, image of what the constituent parts of a real-time location system are. Now the companies that sell these products, they generally uh, sell them as being kind of non-disruptive to install, and they're definitely right in saying that if you've got a wireless network uh, on your campus, you, you fairly much will be up and running within you know, a couple of days. The biggest task of installing these systems is the site survey, which involves uh, walking around the big campus with a laptop with a site survey tool, where you're recording the actual uh, signal strength measurements from the wireless access points that are in your vicinity. You load that on into the software, uh, and you're actually mapping uh, your location on real floor plans as you move along as well. So all that information is loaded onto what this company will use, which is a CAHO, onto their location engine. And that's exactly how the system works then. As you're tag when you're tagged in a live system, it, uh, it's sending packets of data out on the wireless network at random intervals. And uh, using the signal strength measurements, it makes a probable, most probable decision on where the actual uh, tag is uh, located. Uh, with the system, we purchased this four different types of tags. We've got your asset tag, which will be used for medical devices. Uh, we've got a patient tag, which we can tag patients with. We've got staff badges, which can be used in security for, you know, to uh, replace your standard staff badge. And we've also got temperature and uh, humidity tags. Now, like all these modern systems, the, the real intelligence lies within the actual software. So you can set up a lot of business rules and alerts within the software. So, for example, you can break up your floor plans into zones. Uh, and even sub up levels, and you can assign tags to those zones. So, for example, if a tag leaves that zone, you can get an alert by the application, by emails, or by text messages. I'll go through a few examples here in a second. So, the, like, basically, the proposed solution and benefits of these, uh, this technology is number one, I think companies initially would have saw this as for asset utilization. They saw biomedical engineers, clinical engineers utilizing this technology for you know, service contracts, etc. But where the real value and where to see the future of this technology really is in workflow management, the process throughput, and then into the support piece then as well, which is safety and security. So a couple of examples of how we've used the technology, also there's a screenshot there on the right of the fifth floor of the Cardiff Human Centre on the left there with two Cardiff killers, and this is the engine security on the right hand side. And you can see the little images of uh, equipment there, they're actual live um, assets that are within that floor plan. And so obviously from a clinical engineering perspective, we use the technology just find the equipment on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's been fantastic for that. But we've also worked with a number of other departments, for example, cardiology. They're cardiac technicians, obviously perform a lot of uh, ECGs and a lot of EC machines. <coughs> and they're quite good at bringing the equipment back to where it belongs, but obviously doctors borrow it, and they end up leaving it at the bedside where they used it. So the cardiac technicians often cannot find the ECG machines, and they now use the technology and find it fantastic for, you know, having really time access to where their, where their equipment is. In the dance unit, uh, our unit currently is only a couple of uh, bloodborne uh, or patients with bloodborne viruses. And for these patients, you isolate a machine specifically for them that's not used in general court. And what I've done there is I've tagged those machines and I've actually set up zones within the isolation rooms and the general uh, bay areas. And if the machine leaves, the, the actual isolated machines are stored in the isolated rooms. And if they leave that room again, the appropriate people get a text message they get an email alert and they actually they were alerted by the application as well. And if the machines enter the actual general bay areas, they actually get an alert as well. And this is only an extra kind of layer of protection on top of the normal protocols, but they think it's a fantastic initiative. Uh, it's a big unit, so we've actually tagged their vital science monitors, mobile thermometers as well, and that's saving them quite a bit of time. I've worked with the medical equipment library. We'd love to be uh, tagging the uh, Vibron infusion pumps we have, unfortunately, the footprint of the tag versus the footprint of the device just doesn't allow it to happen at the moment. The future is that devices will actually have the Wi Fi uh, chipset embedded within the technology which will remove the need of the tag. But for now, we can't do it. But I have tagged the docking stations 
You can see Tobin there, the yellow in the box. It's a Tobin there sitting in the, uh, in the fifth floor. Uh, and again, they found that fantastic from a service point of view, and just having kind of record where their equipment goes. I've also worked with a group called the Clinical Research Facility there, part the Health Research Board. They do uh, clinical trials on the campus, and they have a number of fridges where they store uh, new drugs for trials and, uh, and sam patient samples. And they use actually manually have to, uh, they have like, you know, highly skilled, expensive nurses traipsing through the campus on a daily basis, recording manually uh, the temperatures of the fridges. So it's all automated for them now as well. And from an audit perspective, they used to have to report any deviations <coughs> outside the limits. They can show their auditors now on an annual basis that they have a trend, the trend of the future. So they're finding an absolutely fantastic system. So that's, what I, that's the end of the whole RT left side of things. So I'll move on to disruptive innovation. Now, this is a phrase that was coined by a guy called uh, Clayton Christensen back in the 90s. And for the last almost 20 years, he's evolved that uh, theory by applying it to a number of different uh, industries. Most recently being uh, the health healthcare sector, and what he describes as disruptive innovation is it's a technology that brings a much more affordable product or service that is much simpler to use in the market. It allows a whole new population of consumers to afford to own and have the skill to use a product or service, whereas historically access was limited to people with a lot of money or skill. Now, one of the most obvious uh, examples he uses is in the automotive industry. Like said, Ronnie, there, no one might remember uh, the horse and cart. <laughs> but I suppose along came an innovation called the, the automobile, and I uh, suppose unfortunately it wasn't affordable, certainly even mine. And uh, <laughs> so it wasn't available to you know, the large population, it certainly wasn't a simple device to use, and therefore it wouldn't be classified as a disruptive innovation. But then along came Henry Ford. And he mass produced the Model T and became available to the masses. And that's exactly what disruptive innovation is. It, it was a new product that came along and changed the way we, we do our, do our uh, work. So, Christensen used the following uh, chart to kind of demonstrate, as was other details regarding theory. And he believes and he's shown that most manufacturers of technologies over, as well as the old, they kind of um, <coughs> overextend the product beyond the requirements of even their high end customers. And for them, for forevermore, for the history of the device, they actually just continually enhance it, uh, which he calls sustained technology. And he believes they end up, I suppose, embedding all their resources, their finances, and even their business models become totally wrapped up in this whole concept. So for example, a good example would be like a manufacturer of a CT machine. They design the first one for the next 10 or 15, 20 years. They continually enhance it. And what he believes happens is they actually um, end up missing opportunities in the marketplace because of that. And the business model has become so embedded in this technology that they actually can't adapt. And when the previous speakers there talked about their own agile methodologies, that's a perfect example. Companies become so embedded in their own technology that they can't actually adapt and uh, take advantage of uh, those new emerging markets. So he's shown that it's nearly always a new entrant into the market that takes advantage of uh, these new technologies, and that's what he calls disruptive innovations. You can see. They're always simpler, they're always more affordable, and they're always almost inferior to the previous version. But they, they continually uh, improve the product, and eventually they become and meet most of the requirements of most of the population, and in, end up actually throwing uh, or throwing the uh, leading company off. Uh, and a good example of that would be like the likes of uh, Xerox in the photocopying business back in the 80s. I can't even remember this. Uh, these guys were uh, war leaders in, in, in the photocopying business. Along came Canon and produced uh, the first desktop photocopier. They didn't think this made any sense. It was cheap, it was nasty, the, the quality wasn't there. But consumers felt this was a good product, and over time it improved, and nowadays we all have a photocopier in our desks, and Xerox don't really exist in the printing world except for really high and stuff. Other examples, again, I've talked about the photocopier in the motor industry. We've spoken about another example in the motor industry would be in the, when the Japanese hit, hit the States. I mean, they came along with their kind of 1.6 Corolla when the, when the Americans were used to their big V8s. It was a simpler, more affordable product. And over time, the Americans believed and found this, this was actually fitted their needs. And now this is no more Detroit. You know, you don't have your big uh, motor car industry in Detroit anymore. The Japanese are nowhere leaders. That's been the same things happening to the Japanese now with the likes of Hyundai, and we see that in the Irish roads. There's examples in the PC industry, the likes of uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, they would have been your own manufacturers of high-end uh, mainframe computers. 
uh, when Dell, you know, Compaq came along with their personal computers, these guys didn't see this as a, as a winning product. They were getting so embedded in their existing technology, they couldn't adapt to make and take advantage of the marketplace. So from a healthcare perspective, I suppose over time, Christensen has found that you know, technology really is only the enabler when it comes to disruption. It, it, the real disruption takes place in the business models. And he, he states that coupling technological advances with appropriately matched business models is the right prescription for our data <coughs> services. I'm obviously talking about the states when he says that, but I think that definitely we've got it here as well. He also says that technologies need to focus on enabling less expensive professionals to do progressively more sophisticated things in less expensive settings. Uh, that's an interesting statement looking for, for any, any, uh, any health service. And by enabling a larger population of less skilled people to do in more convenient, less expensive settings, things that historically could be performed only by expensive specialists in centralized and convenient locations. And in the top right there, I've got a blood glucose uh, monitor, and uh, Christensen himself is actually diabetic, and he would have stated back you know, when he was diagnosed initially that the only test available was that he had to do an inaccurate urine test to get uh, an accurate reading. Or go his GP, where did they extract blood, and as he described, use a kind of expensive, complicated laboratory machine to get a blood glucose level. So what did that mean to him? It meant it was inconvenient, it was expensive, and it meant it didn't have good control over his actual blood glucose levels. And this device, as he described, is a perfect example of disruptive innovation. It handed over a skill or a kind of task that was once performed by a very, very expensive clinician into the hands of a patient, empowering the patient, within the result of a higher quality of healthcare. So I could go on and on and on regarding the whole business models and like he talked about you know, healthcare systems currently are all based on the business model being a solution shop and that is somewhere where you perform a kind of a, a complicated diagnostic uh, a solution to find the problem. But he believes that most healthcare solutions or healthcare problems should be actually uh, solved within the value added process. That's where you actually, you, you know what the diagnosis is, you just need to apply a solution to it. And to do that, he believes we need to move away from the whole concept of intuitive medicine. A lot of old school doctors still talk about, you know, handling patients for intuitive type of business. To be honest, that's probably rubbish. The reality is most medicines pretty can be precision based. We can accurately define exactly what needs to take place, for example. For all of us, you know, you bring your child into the doctor, you know they've got an ear infection, but unfortunately you still have to go to the inconvenience of bringing it to the GP, you get the prescription, when reality is you're probably going straight to the pharmacy and someone there like a advanced nurse practitioner could diagnose the problem. If they need to go beyond that, they could obviously do that as well for you. So, RTLS, uh, disruptive innovation. I'm going to come back to the original uh, uh, phrase uh, that Clayton Christensen described as disruptive innovation. I think, to be honest, the real-time location system is, is obviously purely technological um, in nature. I think as a, as a tool for tracking medical devices, it certainly wouldn't be a disruptive innovation. But if you did, I suppose, start delving into more the process mapping and workflows, you could possibly use a tool as a, an enabler to change the way we do our practice. And if that does happen, which I think it possibly will, it could primarily become a disruptive innovation. Maybe if there's questions after, maybe people have uh, suggestions or ideas around that. So that's it. Thanks very much.